Good morning. Good to see everyone. Want to let you know that tonight, Ashley Spruill's dad will preach. Uh, Brother Leonard will will be back there here with us. We're glad you guys are here, obviously, but we're going to look forward to hearing you speak tonight, brother. So come back tonight at 5 and hear this brother preach. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians 1. We're continuing to go through Ephesians. Someone left a heart up here for me. I think that means they love my preaching. Probably not, probably not, okay, okay, all right, Ephesians 1, you know, as parents, we, we see our children as, as blessings from the Lord, and, and that's what they are, they're gifts from God, and, and we parents want to be a blessing to our children, and we want to raise them right, we want to teach them about God, we want to teach them about life, all of these wonderful things that we can do to bless their lives, but sometimes we want to bless them physically. And that may be getting them a gift that we know they want or taking them on a trip that we know they've always wanted to go there because there's nothing better than seeing that look on their face when they're completely surprised by this gift, right? It's no different with God. He blesses His children, and that would be you and me. In Ephesians 1, now we're going to focus in on verses 4 through 14, but I want to remind you of verse 3, which really sets the tone, I believe, for the whole book, but certainly this chapter. He says, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Two weeks ago, we talked about that. It's good to be in Christ because in Christ only is where the spiritual blessings are. Well, we're going to identify those blessings and break them down this morning. First of all, blessings involving the Father in verses 4 through 6. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So blessings involving the Father. The Father chose us. He literally chose. That literally means he picked us. It sounds like kids on the playground, doesn't it? We're choosing up teams, and I'll take him. Well, I want her. And you could be on my team. And and God chose us. He chose us. He picked us. Before the world was created, Paul writes, God made his choice. God made his election. If you look in 1 Peter 1 and 20, 1 Peter 1 verse 20 says, making reference to Jesus, just like Jesus was chosen before the creation of the world, 1 Peter 1 20, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for your sake. So just as Jesus was chosen before the creation of the world, we were too. Had us in mind long before we were ever created or came to be. He chose us to be holy and blameless, the text says. He, God the Father, has high expectations for his children. Now, if you're a parent, you you understand that because you're thinking, I have high expectations for my children. I expect them to, to you know, act this way or to do their chores or to be respectful, to not talk that way or, or whatever the, the case is. And God has high expectations for us, holy, blameless in his sight. You might think, well, parents want their children to be like them. And I think it's no different with God. Be holy because I am holy, First Peter 1. He wants us to be like him. He predestined us, meaning to predetermine, to decide beforehand. And the us that God predestined is the church as a whole. Now, this idea of predestination does not take away our free will choice. I I, want to camp out there for a second. Because that's where we get confused. And that's where things get blown a little far out of proportion and, and out of the biblical text. Because we look at this and say, well, God chose us, he predestined us. That means he said, you can go to heaven, but you're not, no matter what you do. And you can, but you can't. And and that's not at all what it means. 
This idea, do you remember in the garden? God told him, God told him, look, you, you can eat of all of this, but not this. He says to the man, the man in turn told his wife, his wife was familiar with that. Prohibition given to the man, the man gives the prohibition to the woman, and they mess up. They, they drop the ball. And they do eat of the tree they weren't supposed to eat from, right? God didn't make it so that they couldn't eat from that tree. He said, I don't want you to eat from that. But he didn't make them robots so that they couldn't, so that they had to obey him. You see, the interesting underlying thing here is God wants us to choose him. He chose us. He chose everybody. And this predestination, it, it speaks of God's foreknowledge. He knows in advance who will choose him. But he wants us so desperately to choose him. He doesn't want to make us robots where we don't have a choice but to choose him. He wants us to choose him. He wanted Adam and Eve to make the right choice. Although in his foreknowledge, he knew that they would not. The church that God predestined, so let me back up one more time. The predestination doesn't take our free choice. God chose you. But you got to choose him. I think we want to stop at the, well, God chose me, I'm good. Not we, you and me, but we in the religious world many times. He chose me, I'm good. you got to choose him. The church that God predestined would be adopted into his family. Through God's grace and his son Jesus, we are adopted as his sons. That's what Charlie would call one of those flyover verses because we don't spend a lot of time talking about that. Adopted as his sons mean he, he chose us to be his children in his family. And if you're his children in his family and I'm his child, his son in his family, that means you and me are family. And I got to tell you, that affects, it should affect the way we worship together. It should affect the way we serve together. It should affect the way we treat one another. It should affect the way we bear with one another. We'll talk about that when we get to Ephesians 4. So God choosing us, Him predestining us in this foreknowledge, He knew who would choose Him. He adopted us into His family. That's a beautiful thing. That makes us family. Blessings involving the Father. Look at verse 7 and following. Blessings involving the Son. It says, in Him. Now remember what verse 3 says. All the spiritual blessings are in Christ. So verse 7, when he says in Him, he means in Christ. We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Blessings involving the Son. Blessings involving the Father. He chose you. You got to choose him. Blessings involving the Son. He redeemed us. Redemption is being freed by payment or ransom. Somebody paid it for you. You don't have to pay it. Have you ever been in the drive through and you get up there and you have your money out and you're about to give them the money and they say, oh, that car in front of you paid. That's a pretty cool thing, right? And that means you, you don't have to pay for the coffee or the cheeseburger or whatever it is. Somebody paid for you. It's paid. You don't owe that anymore. And see, when it says... We are redeemed, that means it's been paid. The ransom has been paid. It means that we've been restored to true liberty. But here's the thing that we, ne we need not ever take for granted. The purchase price paid to redeem us was what we just did a minute ago. The blood of Jesus. I got to tell you, I hope. The Lord's Supper never becomes breaking a cracker, sipping some grape juice, and it's almost time for the preacher. 
I hope it's never that. Because if it is, oh, shame on us. Because we're partaking of the very blood that bought us. We're partaking of the very blood that redeemed us. That paid for us. 1 Peter 1, again, verses 18 and 19. He says, for you know that it was not with perishable things. Boy, that's what we identify with though. It was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He, it was the blood, the blood of Jesus that redeemed us. Look at Revelation 5 real fast. Revelation 5 verse 9. These up there for you, good. Revelation 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. The cross paid the price to deliver us from the bondage of sin. What are you thinking about? This is not a sermon about communion, but it's kind of hard to talk about the blood and not talk about communion for me. Because that's what we're, that's what we're thinking about. That's where our hearts ought to be on the spilled blood. And you say, oh, but it's, it's so gruesome, it's so nasty. I got to tell you, the cross was pretty nasty. An innocent man goes to a gruesome death for a bunch of people that deserve the death. Pretty, pretty gruesome, pretty nasty, pretty unlawful. But from this side of the cross, it was pretty awesome. But the blood paid for our redemption. He forgave us through the shedding of Jesus' blood. We have forgiveness. In fact, the Hebrew writer would say, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Hebrews 8 and verse 12 would say, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. A quote from Jeremiah 31 31 and following there. Forgiveness means that our sins will not be held against us. Forgiveness does not mean that I'm thinking about at the Basilica in Mexico City that I have to get on my hands and knees and I saw this and crawl across the courtyard and beg and plead for God's forgiveness. He paid the price with the blood of his son. That, that's, that's not what redemption means. You say, well, we've got to have an attitude of repentance. We've got to be sorrowful when we sin. Absolutely, I, I don't have a problem with that. But you're forgiven. I think, I think on this side of the cross, I think as Christians, sometimes we, would, we struggle with just accepting God's forgiveness. When you go to your friend and you say, you know what, I'm sorry that I offended you. Please forgive me. And they say, okay, I do. You're forgiven. When you have lunch with them two days later, do you say, hey, I'm really sorry for that. Forgive me. I, I'm really, and they're looking at you like you're crazy. Uh, we've already had this discussion. I forgave you. It's done. We have forgiveness of sins. That means our sins are not held against us. They're gone. They're gone. Look at, look at verse 7. Actually, tell in verse 7 and verse 8 here in Ephesians 1. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, they're, they're gone, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Uh, we're, we're thankful for the cross. We're thankful for the shed blood. We're thankful for the forgiveness, but we have forgiveness of sins only by the grace that God extended to us. If, if God is not a gracious God, if God does not extend grace, you and I have absolutely zero hope. No hope at all. Because without grace, there's no, there's no Savior that lives a perfect 33 years. Without grace, there's no unblemished lamb, lamb that goes to the cross and sheds his blood for us. Notice what Paul says to Titus in Titus, Titus 3. Titus 3.
Titus 3, 3 and following. It says, at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Maybe it sounds like the front page news today, right? But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. I want you to hear this. He saved us not because of righteous things we had done. We're not saved because we're good people. We're not saved because we serve well enough or serve enough in general. We're not saved by any of those good things. We do those things because we're saved, not to save ourselves. Understand that. The Savior appeared, He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. I believe that's baptism and the Spirit coming into our life, which we'll talk about in a minute. Whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. You know, I think there's two things we've shied away from. I think there's two topics that scare us. And and I don't think they're as scary as they used to be, but we're still not grasping them like I wish we would. And one of them is grace, and the other is the Holy Spirit. Some people have gone off the deep end with the Holy Spirit, so we, we just try not to even act as if it doesn't exist. And then some have gone off the deep end with grace, so it makes us nervous when someone speaks of grace from the pulpit. Well, i got to tell you, if it wasn't for grace, nothing would be possible. Okay, we, we shouldn't shy away from grace because it is God's grace that put Jesus on the cross for a bunch of people that were hell-bound on roller skates. That's to put it bluntly, okay? Grace is where it's at. For it is by grace you've been saved, Ephesians 2.8. Now, we always want to qualify that and say, well, it, it, we're, we're, saved, we're saved by obedience. We've got to be baptized. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not taking away from that. We've got to contact the blood of Christ. He said in verse 7, uh, we have redemption through his blood. We contact the blood at baptism. Baptism is when we come under the umbrella of God's grace. That's how I explain it. But still, we can't take away from God's grace. In verses 9 and 10, back in Ephesians 1, he says, And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth under one head, even Christ. And this mystery he makes known is, and we're going to talk more about it in Ephesians 2. In fact, if you want to look at that real quick. We'll talk about it when we get there. But basically that mystery is that through the cross of Christ, Jew and Gentile become one. He's saying it's no longer Jew, it's no longer Gentile, it's Christian. It's one in Christ. Notice what he says in Ephesians 2.16. And this is just kind of a hint. We're going to go there in a few weeks, obviously. Uh, Well, let me back up to the middle of verse 15 if I can. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two. You're going, what? One new man out of two. The two were Jew and Gentile. And he says, out of the Jew and Gentile, I just want to make them one in Christ. So it's, we'll make one in Christ uh, in verse 16. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. All done through the cross. But the mystery is that the gospel is also for the Gentiles and not just the Jew. We're really going to get into that. In Ephesians 2 coming up. Verses 11 and 12 in Ephesians 1. uh, In him we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Verses 11 and 12 really speak again to our being Chosen and predestined by the Father. So blessings involving the Father. God chose you. And then it's really cool to think of an adoption. An adoption. He chose you to be his son. Chose you to be his child. And then blessings involving uh, the son redeemed through his blood. 
All by the grace of God, thankful for that. But redeemed through his blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And finally, lastly, this morning, verses 13 and 14, blessings involving the Holy Spirit. He says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit Guarantee in our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Why, why, why? In just about every sport that I can think of off the top of my head, and I know as soon as I say that, somebody's going to come up to me after and say, well, you didn't think about this one. I know. But uh, basketball, they've got numbers on their jersey. Football, they've got numbers on their jersey. And the number on their jersey says, you know, I'm whatever the number is, it says, I am a member of this team. I'm part of this team. I'm marked. I wear the number two. I'm marked. I am, you know, the quarterback or or I am the point guard. I'm marked. The volleyball. Volleyball have numbers? You got numbers. Okay. I'm, I'm part of this team. I'm marked to be a volleyball player on this team. And you're thinking, why are you going there with me? Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. Look, when one is baptized into Christ, Acts 2.38, we, we know that well. Uh, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, one, one guy said, the gift of the Holy Spirit is heaven. I think that's, that is the result of the gift of the Holy Spirit. But I don't think heaven is the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38. The result of it, most definitely. But it's not the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38. The gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38 is the indwelling seal of the Holy Spirit. Let's look. Let me back up. Let's look at verse 13 real quick. Well, excuse me, verse 14. Having believed, you were marked in Him. That's the tail end of verse 13. Marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guarantee in our inheritance. When you put that deposit down on the car, or the home, or whatever it is, you're saying, I'm going to, I'm going to, Buy this. This is going to be mine. And so what God is doing when he gives us the Holy Spirit, he says, this is my child. They, they have an inheritance in heaven. This man or this daughter, this they belongs to me. Look at a few passages with me there in Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. Blessings involving the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 and verse 9. I'm going to bounce around. I wish we could read the whole chapter, but we can't. Romans 8 verse 9. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature of the flesh, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. you got to have this, the Spirit. You show up to the game. It doesn't matter what game it is. In street clothes and say, hey, I am the quarterback. I, am, I play this position on the volleyball court. And they're going to say, I don't think so. Where's your, where's your what? Where's your uniform? What number do you wear? I don't see a uniform. And that's what the Spirit does for us when it comes to heaven. The Spirit says, I'm, I'm God's. You see, we, we tend to focus so much on all the mistakes we make, the sins we struggle with, trying to overcome this and that. And, and I get that. But at the end of the day, you know what matters? You're sealed with the Spirit. You, you want what, your actions, good servitude, good actions, good heart, all of those things that are wonderful, they're not going to get you to heaven. You got to be God's child, and that spirit says, That is my child. Look at verse 13 and 14, Romans 8 13 and 14. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you'll live. Because those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. You belong to God. Verse 16, one more. The spirit himself testifies that our, excuse me, with our father. Um, I just completely lost my the spirit himself testifies with our spirit there it is that we are God's children we are God's children the spirit shows that demonstrates that adopted when there's you know you've got that child that birth certificate that says this child is my child if there's an adoption take place there's 
I can't imagine the, the paperwork that must happen that says this child is now my child. And God doesn't have paperwork. He just sealed us with the spirit that said that's my child. That, that's him. That's my son. That's my daughter. And that's what the spirit says. That's what the Spirit is and does. 1 Corinthians 6, let me read a few more. I want you to get this because really I believe that. The two things that have scared us is grace. Some people have overdone grace, so we've said we're not going to do it at all. Some people have overdone the Holy Spirit, so we say, well, we'll just stay away from it. Man, that's a shame. What does the Bible say? And that's all that matters. I don't care who overdoes it and who overcooks it or undercooks it. What matters is what God's Word says. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? That speaks of the indwelling seal who's in you, whom you've received from God. You're not your own. You're bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body, which is the context. Honor God with your body. But it certainly shows the seal of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. What's to come? Heaven. Heaven. And the spirit guarantees that for you. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. This is our last one. Hang in here. Blessings involving the Father, involving the Son, and then blessings involving the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5. Start reading with me in verse 1. Now we know that if the earthly tent, that's our physical body, we live in is destroyed. We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is Mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and given us this spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And so we go back to our text in Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14. You also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed. How do we know you believe? Because you were spotted, you were baptized into Christ. That says, I believe. Having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance. The Father chose us, the Son redeemed us, and the Spirit seals us for eternal life. Many blessings we have from the Father. We need not take these blessings for granted. May we not shy away from our study of these things. May we research, may we study, may we better understand what we have in Christ. Remember Ephesians 1.3, spiritual blessings in Christ. Today, if we can help you, if we can serve you, if you're here and, and struggling with something and maybe need the prayers of this congregation or love and support, Or it could be that you need to be baptized to have your sins washed away. Whatever your need is, we want to help you. We want to serve you in any way. We'll have an elder up here to receive you if you'll come. Together we stand and as we sing.